Welcome to Pathway, we're so glad you're with us today. If you're new here, we'd love to get to know you. We invite you to fill out a digital connect card on the PCC at Home app or pccfw.tv or text the word connect to Pathway text number. To all of you who have continued to give support financially during this time, we wanna say thank you. We're so grateful and we want you to know that from online worship to Pathway groups to community outreach, your generosity has made ministry possible. If you'd like to give, there are several ways you can do that. There are give buttons on our website at pccfw.tv and on the PCC at Home mobile app. You can also text the word give to our text number or you can mail a check to the PCC office. For all the latest COVID-related updates, be sure to visit our website. Just click the red banner at the top of the page to view new announcements and find quick links for Kid City Online, content for students, adults, and more. You can also access all of this through the COVID link on the PCC at Home app. As always, our services will continue to air at pccfw.tv, so if your health is vulnerable, we hope you'll continue to be part of our online community. Thanks again for choosing to show up here. Let's put our hands as we get started this morning. Let praise be a weapon. Let praise be a weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Yeah. 
we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, that for all the purposes, all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. All of God's promises find their yes, are fulfilled in and through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the yes to all those promises, and we as believers, those promises are extended to us. So as we continue to sing this morning, we get the opportunity in worship to say our amen to those promises that God has fulfilled in and through Jesus. So let's continue to sing together this morning and be grateful for those promises being answered. Yeah. 
and abide in you and I pray that you would just be with each and every one of us here give us open hearts and listening ears for your word and what you would bring to us today we love you and we give you all the praise in your name amen as Kevin was saying, talking about the life of Daniel, actually looking at Daniel and his, his three comrades here in the book of Daniel, which has a lot of things to say to us as it relates to the challenges that we're being faced with in our culture today and how do we stand strong and what feels like a culture that's gone wrong and all the pressures that are around us. And so far, as we've looked at this, uh, as we looked in the life of Daniel, we're in actually chapter three this morning of Daniel three. So if you have Bibles want to turn to it, it'd be great if you would. I've been looking at identity, how Daniel made a decision not to bow to the king's identity or culture's identity placed on him, but he's going to live out his identity of who he was uh, in God's eyes. Temptation and how to walk through temptation. Last week we talked about fear uh, and how do we, how do we walk through um, all the fear that we tend to find ourselves facing in life. And this morning I want to talk about how to really stand firm in a culture gone wrong when you find yourself being tested. Anybody ever go through a season of testing? Yeah, at least a few of you have. The rest of you have not. We'd love to have a conversation with you. I have to like to understand just how perfect your life really is. Um, we actually, all of us go through testing. So if you haven't gone through testing yet, your day's coming, and, uh, and it will happen. But our patience gets tested. Our time gets tested. Our strength gets tested. I mean, we go through all sorts of testing in our life. Uh, I heard a great story one time about a, a college student who's getting ready to face a test. He was taking a class in ornithology, which is a study of birds. And uh, this professor apparently had a reputation of being pretty tough, especially when it came to final exams. And so uh, he had studied all week for this final exam, getting all the details down, all the key information he needed to know about the birds that he was going to have to answer questions to on the test. When he came in, he looked up at the wall, and there were 25 pictures of just birds' feet on the wall. And the professor stood up, and he said, here's your test for this weekend, for, the, for today, is you're to identify birds according to their feet. He sat down, this is ridiculous. This is crazy. This is stupid. I'm not going to do this. And the professor said, you have to do this. If you don't do this, you'll fail the class. No one can do this. I am not going to do this. I am not going to do it. Then you fail the class. He said, then fail me. He said, okay, what's your name? Student stood there for a minute, rolled his pant legs up, took his his shoes off, showed him his feet, says, you tell me, and walked away. Actually, yeah, you can applaud that. That's good. Yeah, this, this service actually did better than the other services on that one, so I'll give you a hand on that one. But testing is a part of life. We're all going to go through it, and yet what we know is this. We know that, that when God brings us, takes us through a test, it's not to destroy us. The enemy wants to use testing to take you actually into a season of temptation. But God uses testing to refine us, to shape us, to strengthen us. Matter of fact, sometimes we even see individuals calling out, Lord, just test me in this. Psalm 139. Verse 23, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me. Go ahead and test me in it. And, and, and know my anxious thoughts. James 1, 2 and 4 says that, that we are tested for reason, and that is to consider pure joy, my brothers, in order to face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith that develops perseverance. Romans 5, Paul says it develops hope. 
And out of that hope comes, out of, it develops character, and out of that character comes hope. So here we have Daniel and Hananiah, Michelle and Azariah, or Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who are pulled from their homeland. They're trekked 900 miles away from Jerusalem into Babylon, which is about a 90-day journey. They're placed in service to the king of Babylon, and they're placed in service to the king of Babylon not for just a few years. A lot of times when we tend to look at some of these narratives in Scripture, we have this view that this was a short period of time, that that Daniel, as a young guy, went went into captivity, and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, and Daniel certainly had to face the lion's den, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego faced this fire we're going to talk about today, and then they made their way out. It was 70 years of captivity. Uh, There are actually 70 years, think about it, 70 years of testing their faith, 70 years of living in slavery, 70 years of pressure to give in to what they knew was not right, 70 years of living their lives under ungodly leadership, and even being in a position of serving such ungodly leadership. They're going to outlive three kings, Nebuchadnezzar 2, who's chapters 1 through 3, Nebuchadnezzar 3, who is Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar, or Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar is, is in Daniel 5 and on. And so last week, when we kind of wrapped this thing up out of Daniel chapter 2, we saw that, that Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar, had a dream. He kept having this repeated dream, and he could never remember the dream. And uh, he knew there was some meaning behind the dream, and so he called all the astrologers, the magicians, the sorcerers from Babylon to not only tell him the dream, but to interpret the dream, and that if you cannot tell me the dream and interpret the dream, I'm going to cut you into pieces, and I'm going to destroy your homes, and I'm going to create havoc throughout the land, more or less. And, and, uh, and if you remember, Daniel heard about what was going to happen. He heard about what the king was going to do, and so he walks calmly into the king's chambers, more or less says, settle down, Neb. You know, maybe we can get this thing figured out. And, uh, and then he prays, and he calls Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as we know them by those names, around him. And they begin to pray for wisdom and for clarity. And then Daniel receives a vision. We don't know if it's a dream. We don't know if he goes to sleep and he, he has the dream. We don't know if Daniel is just sitting around in a moment of quiet and God gives him a vision. What we do know is that he sees what the king saw. And he goes in and he interprets this dream. It's a dream about a giant statue. And really what it's a dream, it's a dream about telling Nebuchadnezzar about the fact that one day your kingdom's going to end, there's another kingdom that's going to come in, it's going to end, another kingdom's going to come in, and it's going to come in, and then there's going to be a kingdom, and that kingdom's going to be established forever, forever. And we'll talk about that as we, as we walk through Daniel here. We'll spend a Sunday just kind of talking about that at, at the very end of this series. But anyway, so, so Daniel, Daniel uh, interprets this dream for King Nebuchadnezzar. And if you remember, when Nebuchadnezzar brings Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and all the other fine young men from the land of Jerusalem into into Babylon to be his servants, to become Babylonians, these guys refuse. And so there's almost a point here that we're going to see in that what we could almost ascertain is is that, that Nebuchadnezzar makes a decision. I'm going to get everyone to bow down to me especially these four guys who I actually like, but who aren't doing what I want them to do. They're not, they're not falling to the program. And, and so, so uh, Nebuchadnezzar decides what he's going to do. He has this dream of this great statue, so he decides to build it. Is what he does. Look at verses chapter, one, uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, just those few verses. It says this, that King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 60 cubits high, 6 cubits wide. He set it up in the plain of Dura, so a mountainous little region, flat area, 90 feet tall, everyone would see this, uh, this, this great edifice that he's creating about himself for people to bow down to. And he set up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, and judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image that he had set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled and for the dedication of the image that God Nebuchadnezzar, that the image that Neb- King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. And then, they, then the herald loudly proclaimed, nations and peoples of every language, this is what you're commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound <coughs> of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lair, the harp, the pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that the King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. 
Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn and the flute and the zither and the lyre, the harp and all kinds of music, you'll get used to that rhythm, all the nations and peoples of every language fell down and worshiped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So he builds this image 90 feet high. It's awe-inspiring. It's incredibly costly. He sets it up in the Valley of Dura, and he picks out some music that everyone will come to recognize and a song of choice that everyone will fall down to. We have no idea what the song was, but they all knew the song. Could have been the heat is on for all we know. I have no idea what it was, uh, but, uh, but we hear, we, they know they hear this song. And then what he does at that point is he puts the test out there. You bow or you burn. Michael Yusof has written a really great book called Discover the Power of One. It's all on the life of Daniel. It's a really, really good, very applicable book. He brings out just kind of four characteristics of this test is what he says. He says, no one was exempt. Everyone had to do it. You, got, you received no exemption card on this one. The behavior required was explicit. You have to bow down before the image. Music plays, down you go. You either bow or you burn. The signal for worshiping was universal. Everybody heard the same song all the time. The penalty for failing to pass the test was, immediately, was immediate, and it would be immediate death by fire. And then the music begins to play, And the people did what they were instructed to do. They fell down. They began to worship the image of God in that moment, except for three. Except for three. Now, when you think about this and you think about today, you know, one of the challenges I think at times we're faced with within our culture, and really the question we have to answer sometimes is, who or what are you bowing down today to today? Is it fear? Is it worry? Is it anxiety? Is it the latest news surfing around? Maybe the voices that you're following via Instagram or, or, uh, or, or, or whatever it is out there. I'm, I'm just, I'm lost on this stuff, to be honest with you. My kids will explain it to me later today, trust me. Uh, those voices you're following, you know, is an issue of security or image or control or anger or even temptation that you're falling down to. What are you refusing to bow down to today? I hope there are some things you're refusing to bow down to. Out of, out of really maintaining a character that would bring honor to Christ, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego refused to bow down. Someone kind of articulated it this way. Can you envision this tremendous sight? Thousands of people gathered on this desert plain and stood before a 90-story golden statue. The throne of King Neb with its royal guard was on the right. To the left, there was a raging furnace to remind everyone of the severity of the command. There was absolute silence as the crowd of thousands waited for the music to begin. And suddenly, the awesome silence was broken with sounds of many instruments. People all around went to their knees, and then the sea of humanity fell like a wave on their faces before the image and the throne. But in the middle of this sea of bowing humanity, three figures stood firmly, quietly, and confidently, not bending a knee. Not bending a knee. And then verses 8 through 13 tell us what happens. He says, at this time... Some astrologers came forward and they denounced the Jews. That word denounced is an interesting word in the Hebrew. It really talks about they slandered these three young men. They they more or less with their words, they were going to eat them to pieces is what they were going to do. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, may the king live forever, your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold that you have set up for them. Now, what was going on here? Well, these astrologers, they are mad, and they are jealous at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these these foreigners that have come into their land that have actually gained the attention and the favor of this king. Remember in Daniel 1, Daniel 1.20, after Daniel, uh, you know, kind of makes his mark and going to hang on to his character and not do what the king does and try to prove himself in a very kind, gentle way, it says in verse 20 that in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and chanters in his whole kingdom. He's amazed at their intellect. And they begin to rise in prominence over those that have been part of this land and that the king has looked to for a very long time. Daniel, after he 
gives the dream and interprets this dream to the king. In verse 49 of chapter 2, he requests the king appoint Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as administrators over the province of Babylon. And so these guys are getting pushed out of their position of prominence. These three Jews are now coming in to take prominence, and they look at this as an opportunity for payday. In other words, we're going to turn the heat up on this deal is what we're going to do. Verses 13 through 15. I don't have it for you on the screen, but just listen to what it has to say. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these, these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold that I've set up? And, you know, again, the king has an affection towards these guys. Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music... If you're ready to fall down and worship the image that I have made, very good. Now listen. But if you do not worship it, you will be immediately thrown into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Listen. Is he testing Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Who's he testing? God. Let's see what your God can do. This is a defining moment for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I mean, you bow or you burn. And I have no idea what was going on, going, going through their heads at this moment. I think when Daniel heard the king was going to cut everybody to pieces and destroy their homes, I think there was probably a tinge of fear. I think there was some nervousness that was there. I think there was, a, there was enough saying, I need to do something here. I need to, need to figure this thing out. And, and I have no idea what raced through the heads of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but what I do know is their response was a reflection of their deep and abiding trust in God. Let me just kind of sidestep this for just a moment. To all you parents that are out there. You know, we talk about Kid City and, and, and just how valuable that is to us as a church. But let me just say this to you. That is, we can do our best to supplement what you do. That's about the best we can do. And, and really, when it comes to, to your kids, you as parents are responsible for what you pour into your kids spiritually. I mean... Certainly, we do our best to to disciple and do what we can, but your home, the home is the primary place of discipleship. It's where your kids see your faith lived out before them. It's where they see you walk through those seasons of great difficulty and great fear and great testing. It's in those little moments. And the fact is that these guys stood strong, and they didn't stand strong because they were in that moment. They were in, in the fire in that moment or facing the fire in the moment. They stood strong because of what happened here. They stood strong because of what happened here. They stood strong because of what happened here. And what happened here? (laughs) And I'm going to tell you right now, you're not going to get it all right. You know, I got a 12-year-old. I've got a 21-year-old, 19-year-old, almost an 18-year-old. And there are times I'm not getting it right. I am failing as a dad. Seriously, I felt that way many times. And, and yet it's in those moments when I got to look back and I got to realize, okay, we did, our, we did what we, we did. We, we did our best to raise them, to raise them with an understanding of who the Lord is, to raise them with an understanding of his character, to raise them with an understanding that he doesn't abandon us in the fire, that he's with us in the fire, that even though things aren't always good, We can trust in his goodness and his faithfulness. And it matters. Because the truth is, there's going to come a time when those little ones are going to be here and they're going to face some really great, some significant difficulty. And they're going to lean back to what they've been taught and they're going to lean back to what they know. It's so, so critically important that you do that. Look at Daniel 3, 16 through 18. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. This is a really significant verse, folks. We do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into a blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. This is a really significant verse. But even if he does not, even if he does not do it the way 
We would like him for him to do it. We're going to continue to worship him. We're going to continue to put him up. He is our God, and it's not going to cause us to bow to any other God but to our God. So we know what happens in verses 19 through 30 is they refuse to bow. The king heats up that furnace seven times hotter than it needs to go. And matter of fact, he just probably just turned the knob or threw in whatever he needed to throw in and get it as high as you can get it. We know that when they were put into that fire, the guards that put them in, they died immediately. They go into that fire, and then eventually somebody looks in, and they not only see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in that fire, but they see a fourth man in that fire. What we know is in the Old Testament, that is, a, that is an image of Jesus Christ in the midst of that fire is what it is. And, uh, and, and they are saved. The king looks at that, and then suddenly towards the end of Daniel, we see the king says this and really does this, verses 46. Then King, king Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel, paid him honor and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. And the king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you are able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all its wise men. And moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained in the royal court. They were elevated again because of their faithfulness to God. So what does this all mean to us? Well, let me give you the big idea for you this morning. We're going to walk through this really quickly. Simply this. The more that I abide in God, the more able God becomes to me, even when I cannot see how God is going to work out the situation. When you walk into a situation, you see what you see. You don't see the end. You have no idea where the end is going to take you. But what we do know is when we trust in God's sovereignty, we trust in God's providential plan, we trust in the fact that God is always present, that he never leaves us, he never forsakes us, that he's got a plan that's going to, it's going to do a work inside of us, we can trust him to know that he's going to carry us through this situation. And so when you're faced with a fire, what do we learn from these guys, but also what can we hold on ourselves? Well, here it is. The strength of their faith, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, their strength of their faith in God created a greater resistance to bow to the culture. The more they, they developed their faith, the more they refused to bow to the, to the culture. And this took courage, but their courage was driven by the depth of their conviction to keep God at the center of the problem. This week, as I was studying this message and really reflecting on it, I came across some great thoughts uh, from another, another preacher, and he, he had some interesting things to say about about these three guys in this moment that I think are really applicable to all of us, actually all four, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They had faith in God, but they had hard lives. They had a deep, abiding trust and faith in God. But that didn't eliminate the hardness of their life. Listen, friends, if someone tells you when you're going through a hard time that you're going through a hard time because you lack faith, that is not why you're going through a hard time. Now, you might be messing up, that's creating a hard time for you, but, but there are going to be seasons in your life. Jesus even said it, in this life you will have trouble. You're going to have seasons of difficulty and hardness. You're going to have seasons of testing, but that does not mean that God has removed himself from the situation. What they show us is continue to remain faithful to God in the midst of all this. They had to make a choice. They had to make a choice, and they chose to hold on to their faith. That Are you going to bow or are you going to burn? I'm going to hold on to my faith in the midst of this moment. I'm going to hold on to what I know to be true about God in the midst of this moment. I'm not going to give in and compromise my character, compromise what I believe about God. I'm not going to bend a knee. Listen, they were slaves to the end. They were slaves to the end. In other words, their life did not end with a pretty bow. It didn't end with a pretty bow. But they kept their eyes focused on the prize. In fact, Daniel... Chapter 12, the last verse in Daniel says, As for you, go your way till the end. You will rest, and then at the end of the days, you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance. It's really interesting. As I thought about that verse, it reminded me of 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. That for I have already been poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Can you imagine in those final moments of your life, 
hearing those words from those who have watched your life. You finished the race. You've ran it well. Get your crown. Those are great words to hear. Great words to hear. In other words, don't bow to culture. Keep your focus on the race. Keep your focus on honoring Christ in all of it. Let me give you the second thing, and that is that God did not deliver them from the fire, but in it. He did not deliver them from the fire. They were going to go into the fire. We are going to go into the fire. You're going to go into seasons of great difficulty, but God has not abandoned you. Christ has not abandoned you in it. When it comes to our culture wars, the fact is that we face these culture wars, and many times I sit back and think, I think we've lost the culture war. But that doesn't mean that we should stand up against the challenges of culture by going, that means that we need to stand up against the challenges of culture really by going to our knees as well as by, by speaking freely the truth from God's word. And to realize that culture may put us through the fire. Our situations in life are going to put us through the fire. But God has not abandoned us. He's with us in it. He's present with us in it. He does not leave us. He does not forsake us. He is faithful to us in those moments. So as you're forging out your faith in the midst of the heat, let me give you just a couple things to think about and just to walk away with this morning. First of all, believe that God is able. Believe that God is able. They believed that the God that we serve is able. However, even if he chooses, even if he makes a choice not to demonstrate his ableness in the exact moment, they will still serve him. They expressed a belief in God's power, but also belief in God's wisdom. They believe that not only is God powerful, but God is wise enough to know how and when to use his power. The greatest example for this is on the cross, right before Jesus actually goes to the cross. He's in the garden, and there's a little, little bit of a, of a scuffle that breaks out, and Jesus calms a moment. Wait, 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 wait a minute here. I didn't, I didn't come to create a revolt. He said, don't you guys know that I could ask my Father in heaven to send down an entire legion of angels, and we could end this deal right now? But he knew there's a greater purpose in mind. He knew I, I had, he had to go to the cross to pay that price for our salvation. Matter of fact, Tim Keller said it well, that Jesus lost all his glory so that we could be clothed in it. He was shut out so we could get access. He was bound and nailed so that we could be free. He was cast out so that we could approach. And Jesus took away the only kind of suffering that can really destroy you. That is best, cast away from God. He took that so that not all suffering that comes into your life will only make you great, but a lump of coal under pressure becomes a diamond, and the suffering of a person in Christ only turns you into something gorgeous. That when you're in the fire, he's in it with you. He's working with you in it. And because of that, you can believe that God is able and you can rest in who God is. That Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego had no idea how God would act. But what they did know is that God's character is never changing. You know, every so often I get what I call kind of private pastoral moments. And uh, over the years of doing ministry, I've really valued these moments. Moments when I'll get a phone call. And uh, I'll walk into a situation, whether it be in the hospital or in someone's home or someone will come in and they're walking through a really difficult, very hard moment in their life or in their marriage and I get a chance to sit down with them and listen and kind of invest in it and be a part of it. Walk into a hospital situation and, and walk with a family through a great tragedy and just, these, these are very, I just really value these moments. They're just very precious moments. They're private moments. Many moments I, I don't ever talk about and and, uh, but there was a moment a number of years ago, we had a couple, actually, they're friends of mine, they've been, they've been friends of mine for years, and, and, uh, and Dan and Cheryl Mason. Dan and Cheryl, uh, they, they own an engineering company here in town, civil engineering company, and uh, Dan's a civil engineer, Cheryl's, Cheryl's a civil engineer, and they actually deal with septic systems is what they do, that's kind of their deal, which I always thought was a little odd, to be honest with you, but, but they, that was their deal. And, uh, and so, a number of years ago, Dan and Cheryl were attending here at the time, Cheryl was up in the city of Angola giving a bid for the city of Angola for a new septic system. And she passed out in the middle of the bid. And what had happened is she had a brain aneurysm. They flew her to Lutheran, and she was at Lutheran Hospital. And uh, Dan called me up. I think I was on vacation, and I was coming home actually that day. And, and so, um, you know, I said, well, how is she doing? He says, she's, she just seems like normal Cheryl is what it seems like. And he said, but they're going to do surgery tomorrow morning. And I remember, I, it was a Thursday night, and so I walked into the hospital, and I got into the hospital, and, uh, and Cheryl was, was sitting there, and she'd asked everybody else to leave, and she just wanted some private time with me. 
And so we're sitting down, we're talking about the, the surgery coming up, and, and she's a smart lady, and she said, Ron, she said, I don't know how tomorrow's going to go. I don't know if I'm going to live or survive. But if I die, I want you to read these verses at my funeral. I said, well, what are they? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. She said, Ron, I want everyone to know, no matter the outcome, that my faith in my God never wavered. And I'm going to trust in his plan. Next morning, they did that surgery, and it didn't go well at all. And uh, and Cheryl survived the surgery, and then a few weeks later, they did another surgery. She survived that surgery. A few weeks later, another surgery. I think there were like four brain surgeries in all, and the last moment for Cheryl was several months in ICU, and we'd go in at moments, we would sense that something's going on there, other moments we didn't know, and then there was a stroke that took place, and we thought for sure this is it. I mean, we just, everybody prepared this is it. She survived the stroke. Ended up going to a rehabilitation center and, uh, and Laura and, and the kids would go and visit Cheryl on a regular basis and, and there was nothing there. Nothing. Dan prepared this home to bring her home. Dan did all that he could do to serve his kids and to serve his business and to serve his wife and And then one day, someone was with Cheryl, and they kind of threw out under us just a simple arithmetic problem, and they noticed that she moved her hand. And they realized there's something there. They began to work with Cheryl, and she came out of this this state, and she began to communicate. And the thing we prayed about all along was, God, if she comes out of this, don't don't let her forget about you. Don't let her forget your word. She was an incredible Bible teacher with Bible study fellowship here in town. She she knew more scripture than anyone else else I knew. And, And Cheryl began to come out of this. And if you meet Cheryl today, I remember the Easter that she walked in with a cane. That was her goal. She walked in with that cane. And if you sit with Cheryl, she remembers everything she would want her to remember about Scripture and about who her God is, about the moment that she came to faith in Christ, about, about her husband, about her kids, and, and, uh, and, and just sitting with her, with her and, 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 you know, again, but, but I, you know, it's, it's, it's different, but it's, still, it's just amazing what God has done. And when I look back at that moment, it was a moment of a faithful follower saying, I don't know what the outcome's going to be, but I'm going to trust in my God that he's able no matter what. You can rest in who God is. And here's what you can rest in. This is what Cheryl rests in. That's what they're still resting, resting in. I know this to be the case. This is what we all need to rest in, that God is good, that God is present, that God is wise, that God has a plan. That God is good. Our faith in God must be rooted in not what we feel, but in who God is. Because feelings, feelings can be great companions, but they are lousy leaders at times. Your feelings accompany you, but they cannot lead you. God's character has to lead you. His goodness will lead you. And when our circumstances are far from good, we can look to a God who is good, that God is present. He's present with us. He was present with those three Hebrews. He's present with us in the midst of our fires. Psalm 23, 4 says that even though I walk through the darkest valley, that what you are, you are where? You are with me. Isaiah, Isaiah 43, 1 through 4, so do not fear for I have redeemed you. I've summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I'll be with you. God's presence in the midst of our fires is not a promise to deliver us from them, but a promise that he's using the fire to accomplish something that only heat can accomplish in our lives. So when you're questioning the presence of God, in that moment, look back. Look back and just remember the faithfulness of God. Look to the goodness of God. Look to the reminder that He's not abandoned you. That He was with you then, He's with you now. That God is wise. That His wisdom is always at work. 
that God has a plan. And we must trust him in that plan. <laughs> Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him. Acknowledge him. And he'll make your path straight. There have been seasons in my life when I have said to God, I don't understand. If I were writing this chapter, <laughs> I'd write it different. It would, it would it'd be different. I'd put a period at places, not commas. It'd be different. I don't understand, God, but I'm going to lean in on you. There have been moments... God's teaching me and I'm learning, I'm growing. There have been some moments as a parent when, you know, I've had those moments of feeling like, man, I'm failing, I feel like I'm not getting through, feeling like, God, you got to do something and I want to control it and I kid you not, there have been so many moments when I've laid my head down at night and I just said, God, I don't understand. But I've got to trust you with him. I've got to trust you with her. I've got to trust you with them. It's amazing to me that God at times kind of taps in a moment. I see something and I realize, okay, God, you got this. Think about our country, all that's going on in our country right now. Truthfully, this truthful statement. A few weeks ago as I've been walking through this, Lord really convicted me. And I was convicted on, you know, am I going to criticize or am I going to do what I think Scripture calls me to do? And am I going to pray for my leaders? And I found myself at night, laying my head on the pillow, praying for our leaders, for wisdom, for for a sense of reserve, for eyes to be open to everyone, for God to intervene. In the fire today? Some of you are. He's in it with you. You can trust in his goodness. You can trust in his wisdom. You can trust in his presence. He's got a plan. Stand together. I want to tell you if you need prayer this morning, some folks down front love to pray with you. Um, If you're a guest, stop by Guest Center on the way out. If you're looking for next steps, the pathway, stop by next steps. Don't forget what about kids' ministry as well, as you, as you think about that too. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, um, reminded this morning of that song that beautifully gave us a prayer of how faithful you are, how your mercies never fail, how from the moment we wake up to the lying down of our heads, you are fully aware that you lead us through the fire that you were there to guide us as a father and as a close friend. And that if we would just look back, we will be reminded of your goodness and your faithfulness. That as we look to the cross, we are reminded of the depth of your love and your devotion to each and every one of us. Of how you served us by going to the cross and dying for us. For our rescue and for our redemption. For that, we're thankful. Lord, I don't know what anyone is facing in this room, but you do. You know every hair on their head. You know uh, every challenge they're faced with. You know where their emotions are at. You know what's going on with them physically. You certainly know what's happening spiritually. And Lord, you're near. I pray this morning that as we walk out of this place, if anything, we'd be reminded that we're not in the fire alone. You're with us. And maybe what we need today is just simply to to hand it over to you, surrender it to you for your wisdom, for your guidance, and for the work that you truly want to do in us and through us, through the presence of your Holy Spirit. We love you. It's in the precious name of Jesus I pray.
Amen. Thank you again for worshiping with us today. If you'd like someone to pray with you, there are members of our church online team or our staff who would love to do that. Simply click on the live prayer button at pccfw.tv or click the conversation bubble on the PCC at Home app. We encourage you to continue your worship through giving. Just click the Give button on the web or the app or text the word GIVE. Finally, be sure to check the web or the app for the latest updates and at-home resources. We also share many updates through Facebook, Instagram, and our weekly e-news, so be sure to follow or subscribe. Have a great week, and we'll see you soon.